Okay, yes. Hello to everyone, colleagues and friends. It is my pleasure on behalf of our partners, the Middle East Institute, the Conrad Adenauer Stifton Foundation, and the Policy Center for the New South to welcome all of you to this round table on a deeply complex, divisive, and troubling subject, a fragmented society, internal dynamics of Libya's conflict. My name is Len Ishmael. I am a senior fellow with the Policy Center for the New South and your moderator for today's event. Welcome all. To get started, I will invite with great pleasure our representatives of partner institutions to add their own voices of welcome to everyone, following which we will go straight into the subject of this round table. Starting first with Jerry Feinstein, Senior Vice President of the Middle East Institute, followed by Thomas Volk, Director of the Conrad Adner Stifton Foundation Regional Program Political Dialogue South Mediterranean, and Boutra Ramuni, Ramuni, Director of Research Partnerships and Events, the Policy Center of the New South. We start first with Jerry. Jerry, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ishmael. And on behalf of the Middle East Institute, I want to uh, welcome all of our attendees at this conference today. Uh, not only is this an important uh, conversation, an important discussion, as Dr. Ismail has laid out, uh, but it is also the first of what I hope are many initiatives uh, that we at the Middle East Institute will undertake with our friends and colleagues at the Policy Center for the New South and the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung office in Tunis. Uh, this is uh, the virtue of our current situation, uh, the, the fact that we are now virtual and have this opportunity uh, to join so many of our friends around the world in these important conversations. So again, on behalf of the Middle East Institute in Washington, DC, I welcome you and thank you for attending this conversation. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I, of course, would also like to thank the Policy Center for the New South and the Middle East Institute for this uh, partnership that starts today with this very timely discussion, I think. Not only there is today the fourth round uh, in Geneva of the five plus five talks starting, but we are also ahead of the inter-Libyan dialogue starting in a few weeks here in Tunis. And I think we all agree that the Libyan crisis can only be solved by giving a say to the Libyan people. It should be a Libyan-led and Libyan-owned political dialogue process. Of course, moderated by UNSMIL and bringing together different parts according to representativity and of course, transparency when it comes to the selection process of participants of this dialogue process, which is why we are strongly looking forward to this discussion with experts this afternoon. And I hope that it will not be the last one of this kind. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, Butra, please. Butra, you might be muted. Okay, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's virtual roundtable organized in collaboration with the Middle East Institute and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. The ideals of our think tank, the Policy Center for the New South are based on two convictions. The first is that the challenges faced by the global South and African ultimately require Southern and African solutions. The second is that only a pragmatic evidence-based exchange of views between the North and the South can help solve the global challenges that we have in common. Uh, as today's topic illustrates, the Libyan conflict is an African issue with profound consequences, primarily for Libyans, but also for African societies, the Euro Mediterranean region and the world at large. Indeed, the three institutions that prepared today's event 
that I would like to sincerely thank for their efforts and coordination are fittingly an Arab African, a European and a North American think tank. Ultimately, a long-term sustainable solution is going to require sincere dialogue between all the relevant stakeholders of this brotherly nation. The Policy Center for the New South is a Moroccan think tank. With this perspective in mind, it's clear the links between Libya and Morocco ran deep, in fact. Both are founding members of the Maghreb Union. Exchanges between both countries have also been going on for centuries. Five years ago, we saw the signing of the Libyan political agreement in Sherat, which remains a valid Libyan framework that can be adapted as Libyan representatives see fit. More recently, we saw meetings in Bosnia between the High Council of State and the Tobruk-based House of Representatives of discuss discussing, among other aspects, the allocation of sovereign position pursuant to Article 15 of the LPA. Ultimately, Morocco remains committed to a Libyan, Libyan political solution that is Libyan-owned and Libyan-led. While a lot has been said about the geopolitics of the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and the Sahelo Maghreb region, Libyan civilians and civil society are aspects that deserve more prominence. As a result, the Policy Center for the New South, in collaboration with its partners, has organized today's roundtable with Libya's internal dynamics in mind, putting the Libyan people at the heart of the solution. With Libya's transition to what is hoped will be a stable and thriving democracy, this panel of brilliant experts promises to shine a light on the undercurrents of Libyan society. In sum, I look forward to this compelling roundtable and thank everyone for joining us today for. I also must apologize to, to all of you because I'm called to another meeting and I wish you all the best with a fruitful discussion. Thank you so very much, Butra. Glad mm. that we could have you with us. Colleagues, mm. I will now move directly into the subject at hand. I'll spend about two, two and a half minutes just uh, setting the stage a little bit deeper, so to speak. In the nine years since Colonel Gaddafi's government was overthrown on August 20th, I think, 2011, the country has been torn apart by rival and competing forces, aided by external backers. A host of divergent interests, both internal and external, contribute to the instability within the country as well as the wider region, while the civilian population continues to bear the brunt of the ongoing conflict and misery abounds. Over 200,000 persons have been displaced since the conflict reignited in April 2019. Despite calls for truce, the effects of conflict are the norm throughout most of the country and insecurity continues the displacement of people hindering their ability to return home. While most discussions about the Libyan crisis revolve around geopolitics and international interference, all of which are very valid, internal divisions within Libya's civil society and political institutions have also played a fundamental role in destabilizing the country. Governance in Libya is fragmented with very few national actors. The main protagonist is supported by different groups both within and outside of Libya. And the country continues to lack political institutions that are seen by all Libyans as legitimate, while sections of the almost 2000 kilometer coastline have fallen into the hands of those who would engage in profit from untold human misery with people trafficking and others running the full range of illicit activities. The situation continues to be highly fluid as well as divisive. So many questions require deep and thorough interrogation, which we will not have the time to go into today. But some of them we will, because we must. What is the situation on the ground today? Who are the main actors? Whose interests are being served? Why does peace seem to be so elusive? 
what are the major obstacles to stabilization? And perhaps the hardest and most pointed question is Libya and are the people of Libya better off than they were nine years ago? Our distinguished speakers will help us make sense of it all and advance our understanding of the dynamics on the ground. They will also help us get a sense of the future as we ask a deeply reflective question, is there reason for hope? On a quick matter of housekeeping, in the first part of our session, each of our speakers will be invited to table initial statements, after which we will get into what we expect will be a rich and dynamic conversation between the group. My first set of questions will be directed to our first three speakers. Colleagues, and I guess I should announce who our first three speakers are before asking the questions. Uh, they are Amanda Cadillac, founder and director of Evolve Governance, and Mohamed Dorda, co-founder of the Libyan Desk. And the questions are quite simple ones to begin with. Colleagues, please paint for us the picture on the ground at the current time. What is happening? Who are the main players and actors? What is at stake? Whose and what interests are being served? And perhaps we can start with Amanda, please. Amanda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me as a guest today and um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, so I have some prepared remarks um, that piggyback what Thomas and you have just highlighted. Um, for the first time since 2014, since the conflict began, there is more optimism now about the possibility of a political settlement than at any previous point. The two parties to the conflict appear to be communicating more effectively and are working independently of one another to further progress across thematic areas, the political security and economic tracks. The withdrawal of Khalifa Haftar as the East's primary negotiating figure, mutual ceasefire statements by Aguila Saleh and Fayez Saraj, agreement by both central banks to subject themselves to audit, discussions on the constitution recently held in Egypt, and the lifting of the oil blockade and resumed oil production are prominent examples of that progress. The outcome of the talks as mentioned in Geneva this week will lend insight into the possibility for progress on the security track as the search for line over the past several weeks was stable relatively, but tensions have increased in recent days. Um, the ongoing political dialogue, Libyan political dialogue that is engaging local actors will also be very significant in, in determining the progress for Libya going forward. These developments would indicate that leadership, and I use that term very loosely, on both sides appear to be coming to the conclusion that violent force will not produce the outcomes they seek, which are power over the security landscape, access to state finances, and the big factor underpinning all of these, which is international legitimization. This is sort of the golden goose, the golden goose of international legitimization and all of the benefits that follow on from that is a determining factor in the behavior of Libya's representatives in these forums. But Libya is not, and has, as historically has been shown, has not been able to transition from one phase to the next due to a lack of trust from localized actors in their leadership, and again, I use that term loosely, who claim to represent either of the binary factions, the East-West division, uh, faction divisions. There is an intricate web of factors that could easily derail this progress as of late and the tone of reconciliation, the tone of potential agreement to work towards something next, something new. Um, foreign interference, of course, is a big one. The competing interests of Russia, Turkey, France, Qatar, and the Emirates is, is prominent. But likewise, Libya remains hyper-localized and deeply fractured from within. The drifting of Libya's armed groups under either of these nationwide umbrellas over the past six years was driven either out of greed 
for power, influence, or wealth, access to state resources, or a sense of survival. Just as the fighting has lulled nationwide, and I'm speaking globally and generally here, not recently with some of the, the tensions rising in CERT as a flashpoint. As the fighting has lulled and the potential for progress towards some kind of deal seems plausible, more plausible now than in over the past six years, um, the flip side is that the, of that potentiality is that armed groups don't have an incentive to remain unified within each of those umbrella, umbrellas. Um, and in some cases, they may be more incentivized to fight against one another for the spoils under each, that each of the umbrellas provides due to the international legitimization that is afforded them. Um, although this is more pronounced in terms of conflict in West Libya currently, the conflicts among factions within each of the umbrella coalitions are currently playing out and is a primary destabilizing factor, even if high level talks produce results. This dynamic has played out almost compulsively from year to year and is likely to continue in the current context. I'll leave you with um, the, the salient issues that I see coming up within the next few months that may have the potential to negate the details that are being hammered out at international forum like um, constitutional, constitution, uh, constitutional conversations in Libya, in Egypt, excuse me. The big one, um, and I'm reticent to focus on Khalifa Heftar as a, a, a figure in this because due to his relegated role now, and because he has been such a prominent and destabilizing and divisive figure for Libya generally over the past six years, that he is still there and he still has a role of some kind. And there has never been an indication based on previous behavior that uh, Khalifa Heftar has any desire to want to um, take a back seat. Um, it's inevitable that if progress on the security front were to be made long-term, his coalition is still under his leadership um, and he will in some way still be involved. Actors in the West remain opposed to his presence in any form. And that will be a main sticking point going forward. The other issue is just the general generality of old patterns. Excuse me, Amanda. Yes. Um, can I just ask you to be very quick with this particular. Uh, yes, I've, I've got two more points, almost finished. Yes, please, thanks. Uh, the intractable internal divisions and jockeying within each of those umbrellas for power and the hanging on of old figures if a new order should emerge. There will be considerable resistance from an array of actors profit, profiting from the current state of affairs and will not compromise for the benefit of Libya. And lastly is the role of international actors, namely Tur Turkey and Russia. And tangentially, I, I'm, I would be, you know, may face criticism for saying tangentially the Emirates due to their level of involvement in, in Libya. But Russia and Turkey are in a position to negotiate with both sides of the conflict in a way that the Emirates is not. Um, and also the nature of their interests is very different. They're more, more geopolitical in nature. Um, so it's those three, three points that I think will be determining factors going forward. The role of Khalifa Heftar and the LNA or the LAF, the old patterns that will refuse to die internally within those umbrella coalitions and the prospect of Russia and Turkey having prominent roles in, in the next phase. That's it. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. We will have time towards the end to come back into an interrogation of so many more of those issues, perhaps in a little bit more depth, but uh, we are trying to get through the first round. So quickly to Mohammed Dorda, and thank you very much, Amanda. Super interesting stuff. Uh, Mohammed, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. And thank you for the invitation. Um, to sum things up quickly, I think the best place to start is the end of the war. Uh, when the war ended in Libya, politics began. So divisions were no longer on traditional lines. It was no longer Agil Asada, Haftar, and then the GNA and their coalition. Uh, as is the case whenever there are political talks in Libya, we saw that atomization began happening and we saw that 
everyone started jockeying and maneuvering in order to ensure their survival. So today the alliances are essentially Aguila Salah, Mishri, Saif Islam to an extent, Khalifa Haftar directly has talks with Meitig and quite a few other actors in Masrata and as of recently with Saraj himself. There are now entities trying to rekindle the Abu Dhabi Accord from last year. So it's interesting to note that the divisions in Libya are not always as uh, as simple, simplified as they're made out to be. They're essentially constantly shifting to match everyone's interests and to ensure everyone's survival. I think the next point of reference should be the ceasefire declaration between Aguila Salah, representing the HOR in the Eastern Bloc, and Saraj from the West. It's not really a ceasefire in the sense that the five plus five military track of the Berlin Conference has yet to actually confirm it or sign anything. So up until now, it's a truce. But what that did do is open the floodgates and created an environment suitable for talks, which we're seeing now getting into its final leg before the long awaited conference in Tunisia. However, these talks are taking place. Uh, Amanda before me highlighted a few of them, be they the five plus five or the constitutional talks. And uh, unfortunately, as of right now, they're not really significant. They're significant in the fact that they're taking place, but not in content or substance. For instance, the constitutional talks that took place in Cairo a week ago there was nothing to speak of or a development from there. The speakers from the HOR, as well as the representatives from the higher council of state essentially met, argued and agreed to meet again. There was, uh, this has been essentially the state of all talks except for the military track of the five plus five. Uh, and unfortunately, I think this is mainly because of the manner in which Ansmil is approaching talks in the sense that they're focusing on a power sharing mechanism that revolves around names rather than a means out of the conflict. Uh, it's a power sharing agreement makes sense in Libya's context, but it makes sense when you actually bring those who have influence on the ground, be they armed groups east or west or at least the political actors of East and West. But what we're seeing now is uh, a nitpicking of sorts of those who meet Ansmil's criteria. So for instance, uh, to represent the Eastern Bloc, we've summarized everything to Aguila Salah himself. And to summarize the Western Bloc, the foundation is a uh, mishri along with a handful of others. The issue here is that these people have no actual influence on the ground and it gives enough breathing space for spoilers east and west in the country to spoil. Uh, the approach in which we are seeing things launch is essentially setting the groundworks for spoilers. Um, we are seeing, as Amanda mentioned, a lot of military mobilization by both GNA and LNA uh, be it in the Sirt Jofra Red Line or in the South, as we're seeing both sides, be it LNA sent, sent troops or be it the GNA prepare or chatter of some sort of movement over there. Um, I think the reality on the ground is, and again, I need to reiterate this, not really being reflected in what's being said internationally. So internally, things are more divided than they've ever been be they East or West. So within the West, we are seeing militias no longer held together by the one thing that was unifying them, which was the mutual threat of the LNA. Uh, we are seeing things get more and more out of control. We're seeing uh, politicians competing amongst themselves, be it within the presidential council or the GNA itself. Uh, we've had weeks on weeks where every politician has issued a statement that in no way, shape or form resembles that of their colleague. And similarly eastwards where we're seeing the, pretty much the jewel and gem of the LNA of saying that we provide security being questioned for the first time in a long time in a very, uh, in a very obvious way. We're seeing attacks take place that have not taken place before. We are seeing 
uh, armed groups attack security directorates or police and uh, check stops, showing that things are not as stable as they once were. I think this is a result of the huge uncertainty that comes with the political talks and the way in which they're designed. Uh, the longer this lasts, the longer we see this uncertainty vacuum uh, persist, I think the longer, the more the fragmentation uh, will take place. Um, I think the substantial part of Unsmill's talks will certainly be the five plus five talks happening now. Mm. Whether or not they succeed will dictate what we should expect going forward. Uh, I believe that these talks will be the foundation for which we can see a way out of our current political uh, dilemma. And um, that is it for me. Great, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I will like now that we move into our second segment. Uh, we've had, I think, wonderful first two speakers who have really taken the time to set the stage uh, to progress our own understanding in terms of what things look like on the ground. Uh, I was fascinated myself to also understand that people are showing up for talks who don't really have influence on the ground. It'd be interesting to be able to come back and find out exactly why this is a strategy that seems to be a win for some people on the ground. But uh, now I'd like to go to our second set of questions, um, which involve a deeper look at the fabric of Libyan society. What have been the implications for civil society? What have been the impact of migration? What is the political culture at this current time? And these are directed to just one of our speakers, Mohamed Elja, co-founder of the Libya Outlook for Research and Consulting. Mohamed, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ishmael, and thank you for the invitation to be uh, with all of you. And what I will start with is actually the last question that you asked, and that is the prevailing uh, political culture that exists in Libya. Uh, and it is one of polarization and one of intense foreign meddling, and foreign meddling not or intervention, not just on the security uh, front, but rather it is on the political and also the media and social media fronts. So there is a lot of impact from the foreign powers that are uh, engaged in the Libyan uh, conflict today and they, their engagement is on multiple level. There is usually a lot more uh, focus possibly on the military movements of Turkey or Russia or this, but uh, I think there is a lot of impact in terms of the influence that these intervening countries have on political figures or factions, uh, but also uh, in the media and those and, and social media uh, landscape. Uh, and I want to go back in time in 2014, when we were about to have the second elections in Libya to elect uh, the House of Representatives, what is now House of Representatives, to take over from the then General National Congress uh, at the time. Uh, and unfortunately in Libya, one of the things that we decided to do was to ban political parties from uh, running for the elections. So basically uh, a, a new uh, legislation or a new electoral law was introduced in 2014 that decided to ban political parties because we thought that political parties were dysfunctional uh, and, and uh, yani, have had more negative impact than positive one. I think in hindsight, uh, that uh, has led to further fragmentation of the political landscape uh, of Libya, i.e. Uh, what we ended up with, uh, kind of uh, the cult of personalities that uh, uh, Mohammed Dorda referred to, i.e. events uh, uh, usually revolve around uh, certain uh, individuals, uh, most of whom, most of whom do not really uh, uh, represent the constituencies or the institutions or the regions uh, they claim to uh, represent. Uh, in 2020, with the current ongoing uh, 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 dialogue that is being led by Onsmil, I think we are going to take this a little bit further, where there seems to be an interest or concerted effort by some Libyan figures who are part of the current process, but also some within Onsmil maybe and the international community 
to bypass the institutions that exist today, which are largely functional. I'm talking about the House of Representatives, but also the State Council. So it is, it's, it's as if they are focusing on the individuals at the top of these institutions, despite the fact that they are not really able to represent these institutions. I'll give you an example. Today, Aguila Saleh, the president of the House of Representatives, called for a meeting of the House of Representatives in Benghazi. Less than 20 members of the House of Representatives that's made up of you know, around 190 or 168 uh, members have turned up to the session, which shows you the level of constituency or support that Aguila Saleh actually enjoys as the head of the House of uh, Representatives. And the same goes for the State Council as well in the East. So there is an effort to try and bypass these dysfunctional institutions, but I think what will happen in the future will be much more uh, difficult to deal with, just like with the case of political parties. When we got rid of political parties, we um, uh, started to have an issue with representation and how these people represent. Uh, the other point that I'd like to make is the complete breakdown of governance in Libya. Uh, so this is leading to complete disconnect between politicians and the political uh, class uh, and the citizens. There is complete disconnect. Um, uh, politics is completely disconnected from the populace and largely does not represent their needs or aspirations for the future. I think the only bright spot, but it is a very dim one, uh, is the municipalities uh, in Libya. Uh, uh, they are trying hard uh, to represent their local populations, but unfortunately their capacity and resources uh, uh, are very limited, are very limited uh, uh, to, uh, and they are nowhere near adequate or enough. And in addition to that, the uh, uh, regulatory framework that exists for municipal councils in Libya or the one that the, the framework that they operate uh, within, uh, really does not respond to uh, the needs or the requirement of, of the moment. I will move very quickly to the next two points since you asked about civil society and impact on migration. I'll make a couple of points in each. Unfortunately, again, civil society is also suffering from polarization as a result and have become to an extent weaponized by the various political uh, or military actors in Libya. Those who chose to be truly independent have found it difficult to operate. Uh, everywhere in Libya. And the result of that is either silence or leaving the country uh, and being uh, uh, exiled. Uh, and to be able to operate independently in Libya today requires a lot of medication, uh, mitigation and navigation of the political security landscape uh, to know where the red lines are for, within which that, that you can operate as a civil society, which again limits uh, the ability of the civil society to, to operate properly. Uh, however, after the end of the military operations in Tripoli, uh, the space has opened a little bit for civil society organizations to start engaging with the UN political dialogue and so on. Uh, but however, it seems that the civil society is also falling in the trap of representing certain agendas or certain approaches uh, of the various political parties and so on, again, which limits their impact. Uh, two points on migration. Uh, so, well, so far, uh, the migration in Libya post-2011 has largely been exploited by criminal networks, uh, not just in Libya, but rather in the wider uh, region by which Libya became a hub uh, uh, for migration towards Europe. However, I think the next phase, considering that the current efforts, and, and I don't share Amanda's optimism, uh, uh, to be honest, that, that the current efforts will uh, hopefully lead uh, to, uh, uh, to a solution, and considering that there is an intensific uh, intensification of the geopolitical factor in the Libyan conflict, it is possible that countries that are intervening in Libya will, at a later stage, be using migration as a political tool to influence their positions or agendas in other arenas, uh, uh, especially against, uh, against Europe, which again will take the issue of migration to a whole uh, new level. Um, and I will stop here. Thank you. Um, these are all very, very sobering reflections uh, from you and the others who have gone before you. Let's move very quickly um, into a little bit more of an analysis of governance and economic sectors. Really and truly, we've already started the, the conversation on systems of governance. We know some institutions are, being, are in place, but they seem to be widely disregarded or bypassed. 
But how are, what about democracy and the rights of citizens, as well as in transient populations? How are these being served? What is the range and scope of illicit activities in the country? And what are the effects of business on business and various economic sectors at this point in time? And I'll invite Jason Pack, non-resident scholar of the Middle East Institute and founder of Lib Libya Analysis LL LLC, and Yunus Aboyu, director of the Governance and State Building Division for the MENA region, United Nations, and former senior political advisor to the special representative of the UN Secretary General to Libya. Starting with Jason. Jason, please, the floor is yours. You may need to unmute your mic. Thank you, Dr. Ishmael. And it's a great honor to be participating in such a distinguished panel. I, I believe such gatherings should be more frequent and allow for more sustained knowledge sharing and, and probing engagement. In fact, given that the current Libyan war economy about which you asked is arguably the most complex and dysfunctional driver of corruption and conflict in human history, I believe its solution lies in devising unique ways of connecting policymakers with experts and the Libyan populace to unpick the morass. Today, it is possible, fortunately, to engage in diplomacy directly with the Libyan people by publishing in real time the workings of a Libyan-led International Financial Commission on the internet and social media in Arabic and English, and making the reformation of the Libyan economy and hence Libyan society a collective nation building problem, a collective nation building project. I see the real problem facing Libya today is its extremely deeply rooted yet dysfunctional economic institutions, which produce perverse incentives, which in turn give rise to the militias, corruption, predatory business practices, the vacuum of legitimate political power, foreign intervention, and the concomitant implosion of Libyan state sovereignty. You asked, Dr. Ishmael, why is it that those who don't have power on the ground are invited to international conferences. And Mohammed Dorda and Mohammed Al Jarrah both commented that, you know, it's just elected officials who go to conferences, but not the militia leaders or the municipal figures, or even more crucially, in my analysis, the heads of semi sovereign institutions who truly control the levers of Libya's billions. They're not invited to those conferences and they have a stake in delaying progress. I call them the status quo party. I can encapsulate this in one aphorism. For too long, international policymakers have thought, we can't try to fix the Libyan economy and its entrenched subsidy system while there's fighting going on. But that logic must be turned on its head. The conflict can't be stopped while the subsidy system is going on. If we go back to when the national conference was canceled, in April 2019, then UN Special Envoy Ghassan Salama said, we can't hold the national conference. There's fighting going on, we gotta cancel it. That's the exact opposite of what should be done. When the fighting is going on it's, and it's intense, now is the moment that we must be trying to reform the root causes. And that's the subsidy system that allows anyone who's in a militia to essentially print money. Um, that's what needs to be reformed right now. And the implication of this argument is that all these international attempts to mediate, which focus on bringing Siraj and Haftar together or the HOR and the higher state council, and we can debate if those are functional entities or not, or even the populations such as Shargawis, Easterners and Garbawis, Westerners together, or trying to unify the army as the Cairo talks try, or trying to tax, tackle the proxy dimension of the conflict as the Berlin conference has tried and boxing out um, the flow of arms as the UN arms embargo has tried and failed to do, all of that's irrelevant without a meta deal about the various roles of Libya's economic institutions, the black market rate of the dinar, official rate of the dinar, and subsidies on petrol. If you don't address those things, any mediation is bound to fail as the political morass of divided legitimacy is just a symptom of the economic and structural factors which are the cause. Now we can use this analysis to look at the so-called Maitigue Haftar oil deal, which was mediated in Sochi last month. This is just the political deal where Moscow scooped prior technical and diplomatic work done by the UN and the Americans 
in the late spring and summer. They stole the foundations of the idea of the using the Libyan foreign bank held NOC reconciliation account and just to create a, a certain set of optics which would you know, forward Russian aims to dominate the Libya file while fundamentally ignoring the real issues which have always been how will revenues be distributed? Who can control how central bank funds are, sp are spent? And unless fundamental change happens there, we're faced with these same unaccountable, op opaque and dysfunctional economic institutions. Bizarrely, even where incremental multi-layered progress has been made on some economic issues, this is relegated to the shadows and is not foregrounded in the big picture international approach or even the Libyan-Libyan dialogues. So the forensic audit that was mentioned of the Eastern and Western banks of the central bank, which is being conducted by Deloitte, it's finally underway, but it's being carried out amid too much secrecy for my taste. And nonetheless, you gotta take what exists and it could be a useful stepping stone. So the multi-round talks which are happening in Morocco and Tunis and Geneva and Cairo and the ongoing audit could form the basis for having the main Libyan institutions and political players. And I mean those institutions with power, the central bank, the NOC, the LIA, Liptic, GCAL, and the audit bureau requesting an international financial commission. This step cannot wait for a peace deal between the East and the West. It must precede it or be an integral part of it. And for any audit process to be successful, it must not be conducted as business as usual, delegated to giant corporations like Deloitte or regular functionaries at international institutions like the UN, the World Bank, the IMF. That's all been done and tried and failed before. For those interested in the details of how I'd like the International Financial Commission to come into being and what it should be tasked with doing, please consult my recent papers with the Middle East Institute or IAI Rome. I envision assembling a Libya dream team, like a vastly expanded version of those gathered on this call today, working together with the highly empowered auditing body with teeth, the teeth to name and shame and place sanctions, not at all like what Deloitte or Ernst Young are doing, and making all those findings instantly available in English and in Arabic on the web. Intelligent and civically minded Libyan patriots, especially those of the younger generation, are willing to put the past behind them and forget old grievances about whose cousin and which tribe started which war. They need the help of their genuine allies abroad to provide the protection, technocratic expertise, and political cover to actualize their visions of genuine reform, renewal, and peace and a better future for their kids and grandkids. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. There's just so many ideas um, coming from each of our speakers. It's really very hard to, to, to contemplate the magnitude of the situation that uh, bringing peace to Libya will actually entail. Allow me to invite Yunus Aboyub, and forgive me, Yunus, I know that I've mispronounced your last name. Yunus is the Director, Governance and State Building Division for MENA Region, the United Nations, and a former Senior Political Advisor to Special Representative of the UN Secretary General to Libya. Yunus, please, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you. Um, I would say basically to answer your question that the legacy of the former regime has left an in inherent weakness of civic attitude in democratic culture. And this coupled with the rising influence uh, with, of the periphery at the expense of the center interacted with uh, an increased uh, politiza politicization of public administration, inclusion, exclusion rather, and mistrust, which um, increased the dismantlement to whatever was left of the state and institutions in the transitional phase. So the early part of the uprising was marked by clear signs of oppositions to building military and security institutions and calls for the political isolation of uh, what was perceived uh, as, as people who were in the state and middle and high ranking officials of the former regime on the pretext that they, uh, they were not uh, suitable for the transition phase. That was known then by the political isolation law, which was a terrible mistake that uh, it dismantled whatever uh, government institutions were uh, were left and signaled that a, a transition would, would likely to fail then. So basically, uh, the, the problem with Libya today is that there is an absence of state. You have governments, but you don't have a state. You don't have functioning institutions, which led to an increase in the number of our militia uh, 
Libya has become a major destination of uh, uh, armed groups uh, and fighters from various countries, which was facilitated by forced borders and armed proliferation. Uh, institutions were hijacked, uh, therefore, and appropriated by either by for tribal or regional interests, creating more drivers for conflict uh, instead of uh, the reverse. Many and new ad hoc institutions were built to serve as the existing actors or meet the demands of factions, which complicated the matter further. So the institutions became reflective actually of the country's division, entrenching the struggle rather than re reconciling the need for state building. Uh, the failure among Libyans, and unfortunately also this is due to uh, the intervention uh, and competing interests of uh, foreign actors, um, so it led to the failure of Libyans to agree on a vision for the desired type of state and governance system. This has further weakened the, the remnants of uh, Libyan institutions inherited from the former regime, uh, which was already characterized by very inefficient bureaucracy, which was bloated with employees. Uh, this this uh, has led to a chronic sort of uh, dysfunctionality which became, has become the order of the day. Critical lack of control over public spending leading to further corruption and squandering of public funds, which uh, uh, led to this uh, uh, state of affairs that we know today where funds are basically being squandered uh, around. Uh, I would briefly list a number of what I see as very problematic issues of governance in Libya. Uh, today, uh, like the proliferation of weapons that threatens the, any prospects of building states or stability. Uh, the absence of, uh, of a dialogue culture, unfortunately, even though we see a lot of different meetings all around the world, but there has been an increase in an entrenched armed culture rather than a dialogue culture. People have understood that in, the, in order to make their voice heard, they need to have a weapon. There's a spread of extremely popular frustration and negative attitudes towards change, uh, given the chaotic situation following the 17 February uprising. There's a rise of tribal and regional sentiments over national identity, uh, which uh, has shown itself in increased call for federation or some sort of decentralization that is actually just a, a namesake for uh, federation or even separatism for some people. Uh, the acquisition of political and economic and social influence by leaders of armed militias uh, has become uh, very prevalent and obvious, uh, which led to a continuity of fragility of official state uh, institutions. So basically to sum up, the problem that was uh, already existing in the former regime was exacerbated in the transitional phase. Uh, and instead of going for building institutions and state uh, uh, in the 2011, after the fall of the regime, uh, Libyans rushed into uh, what divided them more, which were the elections then, and later on power sharing agreements that never uh, focused on building institutions for, for, for the state. Uh, I see now that there is some efforts in the region to help with, with building institutions and agreeing on at least limiting the dysfunctionality and the uh, spread of parallel institutions, like uh, recently the meeting in Morocco, where uh, uh, the, the, the two uh, uh, parties have agreed to sit and discuss how to unify certain institutions. This is a good uh, the first step, but I think the international community and Libyans themselves should own, uh, the Libyans should own this process and focus on institutional building and state building rather than just power sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eunice. Um, interestingly, we're coming to our fourth segment where we were going to take a, a bit of a deeper look at the issue of external actors, but every single um, aspect of our conversation from the very beginning has involved external action, actors and various interests being served. And now we're going to delve perhaps a little bit deeper into these uh, dynamics. In terms of whose interests are being served, what are the policies, security, humanitarian, economic, and others in place with respect of Libya at this point in time? What are some of the initiatives on the ground to assist with mediation and reconciliation? Why is peace so elusive? 
What are the main impediments to articulate in a coherent strategy? And I think we've already started diving right down into this particular issue. And what are the geopolitical ramifications of the situation in Libya? And we will be giving the floor to three of our colleagues this afternoon. Imadadain Badi is a non-resident senior fellow of the Atlantic Council. Karim Mezran is a resident senior fellow of the Atlantic Council. And Jonathan Weiner is a non-resident scholar of the Middle East Institute and a former United States Special Envoy for Libya. Starting first with Mr. Badi, um, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I'll speak to the foreign foreign dynamics a little bit, but I'll try and take maybe a local lens uh, speaking to them because I think that still in the past interventions that wasn't really focused on, unfortunately. I do agree with Jason in the uh, about the fact that maybe we shouldn't focus on who started who, wh where, etc. A large proportion of Libyans indeed want better lives, better governance, services, basic rights, etc. But a non-negligible proportion want accountability. For some, that's accountability that runs past uh, almost for the past half century. Uh, it's grievances that straddle that era. For others, it's the past decade. For some, it's the past year. And for others, it's yesterday when mass graves were discovered in Tarhuna again, once again. So that gives you kind of an idea of why that type of social dynamic should be tackled and not everything should be compartmentalized at the economic level because those grievances are there and remain uh, there. Last year's national conference wasn't just canceled either and war didn't just end. Uh, it hasn't, from my perspective at least, it hasn't ended. An offensive on Tripoli, the, you can argue, was the culmination of an effort to consolidate control over Libya for the past, better part of that past uh, decade, let's say. It was forcibly thwarted. Uh, it, was, it hasn't ended uh, after a year-long destructive war on Tripoli. It was launched under false premises and the forces that were aligned with Khalifa Haftar were forcibly rerouted. Now, a front line has crystallized around CERT, uh, foreign interventionism is still there. And regardless of the choreography of talks now being organized in different states, at the moment, the commitment to the ceasefire on the side of domestic parties is tenuous. And even more crucially, respect to the outcomes of the Berlin Declaration in particular is virtually absent. Uh, those that attended the summit uh, for the most part, uh, did not live up to their commitment, at least the, the states that are known to be uh, influential uh, or most likely to break the arms embargo. So the, they're still transferring their weaponry there. So at the moment, it's like a choreography of, of talks is being organized outside uh, with the somewhat ambivalent, let's say, commitment of states that uh, propose being committed to multilateralism, whereas unilaterally, uh, Turkey, Russia, and the UAE are still transferring weaponry, still maneuvering to restart war. And as long as that dynamic is obfuscated by Libyan talks with actors that have little to no legitimacy, uh, you can argue, uh, war is bound to at some point erupt again. So it will be no surprise if in a panel next year by 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 this time now we have a panel discussing how we got here and how war re-erupted as long as that dynamic of multi uh, all unilateralist uh, interventionism is not addressed and as long as we do not uh, look at the past let's say years and address which states have virulently let's say uh, intervened in Libya and contributed to the thwarting of its democratic transition then we will not be able to devise a process that reconciles uh, the what Libyans want and what the foreign, let's say, pragmatic states, mm, you can say neighboring states to a certain extent, Morocco being, for example, one, uh, Egypt being, for example, one, Tunisia being one, the pragmatic states that have genuine interest in the stability of Libya, regardless of the, some ideological interest, how that can be reconciled with what Libyans want. But uh, to an extent, what I would argue... Uh, about the foreign dynamics to an, uh, is that you have states that have proven or have a track record of committing to multi, multilateral, let's say, or multilateralism under the guise of the UN. You have states that have weaponized the multilateral track to advance their unilateral agenda. And you have states that have completely disregarded that track and 
just used unilateral unilateralism as their main means to actually influence the Libyan landscape. Uh, none of these, none of the foreigners have really managed to secure an interest, uh, uh, let's say, it, whether it be economic or ideological, secure something longer than the short term uh, on the Libyan scene at the moment. And I think that speaks to the fragmentation that permeates the Libyan landscape, socially speaking, because that is what's preventing them from actually achieving what they want. Because if it was as simple as uh, pouring weaponry, uh, financing parties with economic resources, uh, well, Jonathan is asking which states are. Uh, well, you could argue that, I, I, personally, I personally argue that the primary dynamic that you can look at is the revolutionary versus the counter-revolutionary one, with the revolutionary one being led on the one hand by Turkey and Qatar and the counter-revolutionary one being led by the UAE. But you have now an outlier uh, in those amongst the states that uh, are intervening, which is the Russia. And Russia is opportunistic. It is not exactly there. Uh, it is not exactly has not a track record of being folded on the, under multilateral initiatives. So you can clearly, it's a bad omen for it to be this involved in Libya, this well entrenched now. Uh, and I think that will make any multilateral process very, very difficult to broker in the upcoming phases, let's say. I'll leave it at that so we can have more uh, in the Q and A, especially since we're running out of time. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, Karim, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail, for this invitation. And thanks for all the colleagues I've spoken before that have really set a very problematic picture. I, there, I remember there was a moment in the past, maybe, where we thought that the solution of Libya was somewhere else, not in Libya. That the foreign powers were really those that were going to decide and if they and if they were found among themselves, bring peace or bring a total war. I'm not convinced of that. I still think that it's, it's a different kind of proxy war than one we're having in Libya. First of all, some actors are not simply paying or fostering a group to act, they, they get in directly. And, that's, and this changes the, the, the dynamics. They are directly involved in the field. And, and this is not really a clear pro proxy way. And, and second, the groups on the ground in Libya are not totally dependent on their foreign supporters. They have, have each one of them, in, in, in every one of the factions, have found a way to deal with the various foreign supporters, to be counted on the ground, to be semi-independent to certain aspects. There is not one country that can tell, boom, do this or do that. And we have seen, we've seen how Haftar behaved with the, with the Russians, with the Emirati, with the Egyptians, and so on. And the other side, the, the same. So I think that we have to understand this, this, this dynamic before we, we tackle the issue of how to have a peace agreement or even a permanent truce that can allow everybody to be sort of, sort of happy. On top of this, I don't deny that there is a, the importance of the economy is, is, is pivotal or, or other. But I also see that for certain countries, we have something much deeper than that. The, 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 the intervention is not dictated by interest, as closely defined, but goes to the essential nature of the regime in power, of the, class, of the political class in power, of, of, of the elite. The case of the Emirates should be studied under this light. It's not only that they want to conquer Libya, to have influence on Libya, or even as they say, to stop this big Islamist conspiracy that they see all over the world or around them that needs, that needs to be hit and destroyed. It goes directly to the inner values on the, on the existence itself of, of the elite in the Emirates. That goes not only to the, to, to the crusade against Islamism, which is even the upper, but also to, to their inner values of a system that is not that is authoritarian or semi-authoritarian that they cannot accept the installation in other countries of the Arab world of pluralist or democratic regime. And, and, and this goes directly to the heart of their construction, of their, of their existence. 
think about Egypt to a certain extent for the regime is the same. Egypt on top of this anti-Islamist crusade, on top of this permanent power, they have the, the valid reason of, of wanting security at their borders. But simply, and the Turks are in another category, but very similar. If we don't address these issues rapidly and concretely, I don't think that, 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 that none of them has an interest in having peace. None of them has an interest in surrendering some, something in order, in order to get something else, which is the basic of, of a negotiation. In fact, while we are all thinking about dialogue, discussions around the world, I am afraid that having seen the modus operandi of Haftar, the Emirates, and all of that part, that is, yes, we deal with negotiations, yes, we do that, but just as a, as a, as a waste, waste a gaining of time, I'm afraid that we, we might not get peace. We might plunge into another, another war or another, at least major clash, because these parties have not or do not see the possibility of seeing the success of their mission in Libya by, by, by what is going on. Compare this to the, to the, total, to, to, to the total different strategy or position of the Russians who are very pragmatic, who, are, who have concrete interests, they don't mind about their ideological side of position and are very, very instrumental and tactical in their action. With, that, with those countries like, like that, you can deal at the level of interest. But I think not, not with, with the other, with those that, that have much more than simple interest at stake. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Karim. You've thrown up even more issues on the table for us to have a wider discussion on. And Jonathan, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, every multilateral negotiation should begin with the words, at least in, internally, let's pretend. Let's pretend. Because I've never seen a multilateral negotiation begin with anything that was very likely to happen if it was something that was going to matter. It's always improbable and um, impos uh, if not impossible. And that was true in connection with the Skorat Agreement that ultimately emerged. People were derisive about its potential. So in the let's pretend category, what I would like to see is the unsmilled process being used to herd cats and the herding of cats is the internationals, as well as the Libyans, um, which is to say you use it as a mechanism for alignment to get people to agree that nothing is going to work better than a political agreement. There are always spoilers. It has to address the spoilers, but it has to find reasons why people might accept it. So you have to look at what does Egypt really want, one of the pragmatist states? Uh, what does Algeria, Mor what Algeria Morocco really want? What does Tunisia really want? Actually, what does Russia really want and need? What do the Emirates really want and need? The Emirates really want and need um, the, the Libya's money not to be going to build um, Muslim Brotherhood resistance movements in the Gulf. That's really the ideological uh, goal, as it were, um, or elsewhere. Um, what Russia wants, ideally, is a warm water port in both Syria and, and Libya or permanent bases. It doesn't just have to be a port. Airports, uh, seaport, it can be, airports are good too. Um, whether it's how committed it is to that and whether it can sustain that if Libyan people say they don't want it um, is a different question. So let's pretend that I'm back in the United States government and it's just me making Libya policy. President does whatever I want, the vice president, the Senate, everybody. Let's just pretend that as, as part of the let's pretend. What I'd be doing is going to Libyans and say, we're going to provide assistance and support for you and make sure that there's sharing of Libyan resources that gets to all the municipalities. So everybody's got their little mini patronage networks. Going back to Jason's comment about the economics, everybody gets a patronage network. You're going to have to deliver some for your people. It's not all going to just be for you. And the US will. Um, invest substantially, but you're going to have to kick the Russians out. That's just the way it is. If you want our help in getting there, you're just going to have to kick them out um, in military terms. 
you're also, uh, the Turks ought to be getting lots of contracts. The Egyptians ought to be having lots of Egyptian workers in Libya in safety and also get some contracts. Everybody, there should be enough contracts for everybody. The Chinese should get some contracts too. But for that to happen, you're gonna to have to give up dreams of conquest. There's gonna to have to be a lot of political alignment, uh, something for everybody, something for all of Libya's regions, some revenue sharing uh, with the municipalities, some uh, accommodation of the decapitalization of the East that's happened under Aguila and Haftar uh, uh, to create their patronage networks. Um, we're all gonna to work to get the uh, counterfeit Russian currency out of um, circulation because uh, that's, that's been a, a factor in allowing people not, not to work out things. And you basically, therefore, try and make the political um, a subset of the economic solution um, and of the idea that there's going to be benefits to absolutely everybody. And so you proceed on this fantasy track where spoilers are not getting rewarded and where um, those who are participants suddenly are seeing some potential benefits flow if they go ahead. You take a very strong position against a version of oil, against new oil contracts going to anybody outside the traditional internationals, against any um, um, fracturing of Libya's functional institutions, central bank, uh, and uh, the national oil company. And uh, you talk about the creation of an integrated national uh, Libyan army, um, which under a military council, which is under civilian rule. You push forward the constitutional talks and you keep nudging everybody along that direction. And you, meanwhile, privately, the United States goes and warns certain countries that are dependent on the United States at least um, uh, maintaining uh, their military equipment, even if it's not going to sell them new stuff, at least maintaining it. And a Biden administration is in a position of saying, I'm not going to be able to do that if you're continuing to use stuff to uh, carry out war in Libya, that's going to be a problem. And there's more than one actor that's in that situation. In fact, there's more than one actor on each side in that situation with the United States. So the Russia problem, Libyans have to take care of. The United States can't take care of. All the United States can say is there are going to be benefits for you if you say so long to the Russia military presence. Anwar Sadat did that a long time ago. There were no domestic repercussions to, to that move. It worked for some of his other moves, but it wasn't uh, his death wasn't caused by the fact that he kicked out the Russians. That was kind of popular. So that's the kind of approach that I would recommend. You have to have an approach that works for Libyans. And you have to have an approach that's going to work for um, the internationals. Egypt wants a safe and secure border, and it wants economic benefits. Turkey wants some economic benefits as well, but that doesn't mean the United States should be encouraging, allowing, or facilitating the division of Libya, which is not Libyan's interests, into spheres of influence, which become some kind of de facto partition, even if there's not a formal partition. There's never going to be able to be further investment in oil and stability in any kind of sphere of influence um, moderated Libya. I assume that every Libyan, other than those who are directly getting benefits from their foreign patrons, would kind of like to see a stable, secure Libya in which foreigners are not telling Libya what to do. The only thing I'd be having, uh, telling Libya what to do is take charge of your destiny, uh, find ways of working together and kick out the Russians. By the way, the, the mercenaries need to go from Turkey as well. The Syrian mercenaries should be gone. The mercenaries out of um, Su Sudan or, Mal or, or Mali or Chad, wherever they're coming from, uh, all that stuff, which will be part of the quiet US bilateral discussions. And then the US should be prepared uh, to use the sticks that it's got to expose bad behavior, to create a price for bad behavior, not only changing what you get militarily or another US assistance, which are still tools, but also to expose and embarrass bad behavior when people are violating their international legal commitments. So that's the strategy. Let's pretend, keep it in one a negotiation under the UN process. Nothing happens until it happens. You just have to get people talking. If people talk long enough, um, sometimes wishes come true. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. You've started to chart, chart the way forward with respect of the next segment of our conversation, but we need to also address a few of the questions uh, from our audience, one of which sort of follows on to the 
the statements being made and uh, Jonathan's input goes something like this. How do Libyans see the role of the international community in their country? What is the level of acceptance of this presence given the 2011 intervention experience? Jonathan, you were the last person to go. Why don't you take a quick stab at that? I'm trying to, what's the core of the question? What, what do you want me to respond to specifically? Um, why would Libyans trust any member of the international community with their future, given what happened in 2011? I, I understand it. Um, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Libyans should not. Uh, you can't ask Libyans to trust the internationals. Libyans don't trust one another. Lack of trust is one of the fundamental features of the polarization uh, and the fracturing of the country. What you have to do is create benefits for people from going down a particular path. So if there are economic benefits, if we go down this path where the benefits are localized, not just national, but also localized, and in which um, corruption gets attacked through a change in the subsidy system so that individuals are getting benefits as well as municipalities. If you get money in everybody's pockets for them to spend as they will from Libyan oil, Libyan oil revenues will get maximized because people who um, try to extort benefits for shutting down the oil will become very unpopular very quickly. So it's a way of maximizing revenue and then distributing the revenue at the municipal level, at the local level, at the national level for certain types of contracts as well. And if you're able to do that, you're creating benefits everywhere. It's not about trust, it's about practical um, benefits. You, know, you can't expect people to trust anything other than the terms of the deal in front of them initially. Then you enact the results of the deal. You see the benefits accruing to you as a result of your participation. And so when you've got these political figures who don't have um, power on the ground, that's part of the, let, the let's pretend is you start talks with them, but then the talks have to include and continue to fan out to people feel represented and see if there are going to be benefits to them by supporting the leaders who are participating. The militias are going, there's going to need to be a vetting in and vetting out process for the militias ultimately, in which the militias turn into local police forces, but there's also a national um, force, which is capable of maintaining security stability and dealing with the outright criminality, which people can exploit when you have an underdeveloped uh, state and state security institutions. The state does have to have a monopoly of force sufficient to counter criminality and terrorism. Um, but it has to be a monopoly force that's used in such a way as to not um, uh, challenge local civic leaders. And so the local civic leaders in turn have to have some kind of policing capacity, which provides some level of security. That's gonna be a very difficult balance to achieve in Libya. I'm not naive, maybe somewhat naive, but I'm not completely naive. Uh, these, are, these are things that have to happen over time and you get there through increased confidence. Thank you. Okay, all right. Another question, um, Mohammed, Elijah, please. You have the floor. Now, uh, very quickly, I just wanted to comment on the on uh, very quickly on the uh, question of the role of the international community. Uh, my issue with Onsmil, in particular is the mandate that Onsmil has and hides behind. Uh, usually, Onsmil has a very weak mandate. It's only a support mission. It also lacks the resources and the capacity to deal with a complex situation such as the one that we have in Libya. And usually in conversations sometimes with, with Onsmil officials or employees, and when you ask, why aren't they doing this or why aren't they playing a role when it comes to things like uh, peacekeeping, ceasefire monitoring, and all of these capabilities, the arms embargo and so on, you find that they say, well, our mandate, they hide behind the mandate. So technically they have a very certain, like a, a very specific mandate and they have to fulfill that mandate. And I think that's an issue. The mandate of Onsmil as it stands is very weak. The capacity and the resources of Onsmil as they stand are very weak and not, uh, and nowhere near adequate or enough to deal with uh, a situation as complex as, as Libya. And in, in, in many instances that has uh, uh, impacted the credibility of, of Onsmil uh, in this regard, but also the cred cred credibility of the multilateral system, the global system uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that exists. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a question from, from the audience. What will it take to get Turkey and Russia out of Libya? Ibadedin? 
Maddy, would you like to take that question? What will it take to get them out of Libya? I don't think that uh, anything will take them out of Libya, to be honest, at this stage. Uh, Turkey is there to be, is there, and it has signaled, and it is signaling, and it will be well entrenched for the foreseeable future. Uh, Russia, on the other hand, uh, aside militarily or with somewhat of a, let's say, an economic deal that would guarantee or secure its interests and move it away from intervening or acting as an actor that would intervene on behalf of the UAE, let's say, because there are suspicions, very tangible ones, let's say, that it is intervening on behalf of the UAE in Libya, at least in advancing its strategic interests a little to no cost because that intervention is being bankrolled by another state. Uh, unless you're able to kind of break that loop to a certain extent and reconcile their genuine let's say, economic interests in the country, uh, you won't be able to get them out. And the idea is to transform their interventionism from something that is military to something that is more economic, more regulated, let's say something that dilutes uh, less Libya's sovereignty to a certain extent. Uh, maybe to build on Muhammad's point earlier, that could that is something that Unsmil uh, could do. The unfortunate thing is that Unsmil does. It's not the problem. Not isn't necessarily with the mandate. Perhaps the mandate should be amended to reflect or to help out at least with the military situation in terms of uh, ceasefire monitoring, etc. Because that requires technical expertise outside of Unsmil's uh, outside of Unsmil's purview. But unfortunately, war happened or an offensive was launched. Let's say so. Now it needs that type of. It needs that type of support, but the main problem with Unsmil is it's only as strong as the multilateralism behind it, and it's only as uh, strong as the UNSC is, and unfortunately the UNSC is very deeply divided on Libya. When it's not one state that's vetoing something, it's another three, uh, and the fact that Russia is on the U United Nations Security Council, a permanent seat there, doesn't help because it will actively try to... Uh, divert attention to whatever happened in 2011. It will try to legitimize the fact that, or it's from its own perspective, that it was a failed intervention, let's say. So as long as that dynamic is what's permeating, let's say, the United Nations Security Council, that it will be very difficult to, to do things. And that requires European unity and US engagement. When we have one, we're not having the other. So that's also another problematic dynamic. That could change in November, but we, we will see, we'll have to see. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, we've got about uh, 10 more minutes, nine, 10 more minutes. Um, I'll start at the top and just invite our colleagues in about one, one and a half minutes tops to respond to any particular aspect of the various conversations which we've been having for the last um, hour plus. I'll start with Amanda. Amanda, is there anything which you've heard which you would particularly like to address very, very succinctly? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, only that earlier Mohammed said that he disagreed with my optimism about the situation in Libya. I'm actually not optimistic. I think I was, my comments were pretty clear that while there is optimism in the air at the state level and international level with negotiation forums that are currently taking place, there is an air of optimism, uh, but I listed a dozen caveats as to why that optimism, optimism should be kept in check. Um, I'm, I, in reality, I would think that Libya is facing, I would anticipate another couple of years of conflict. I, I don't think that this is gonna end anytime soon. Um, and just to the to the last point about I kind of chuckled when you asked Ahmed Adin about what how what would it take to get Turkey and, and Russia out of Libya and the first thing I thought was was a miracle there's no possibility of that happening um, they're too entrenched now their their interests are too involved they're too invested um, and the relationships of Turkey and Russia with all the other actors involved is is, is too deep. So um, that's all I would say. Okay, well, thank you. You know, I, I, I go from being very optimistic or having reason for hope and feeling that it's still a long journey ahead. Um, Mohammed uh, Dorda. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, I think the thing in common everyone said is that we need Libyan ownership, Libyan ownership, yet 
we keep framing it as an international crisis, one that can only be dealt with internationally. Uh, what can get Russia and Turkey out? Libyans. How do we do that? Ansmo. Ansmo's duty is to represent the will of the Libyan people, to ensure stability in Libya, not to facilitate power sharing agreement on what benefits the US, France, Cairo, Abu Dhabi, uh, Russia, well, not Russia now, Turkey and the US. It's absurd that today we are waiting to have four countries figuring out who are prime ministers. Uh, if Ansmil wants to help guide Libyans out of this, do it well. Do gather a round table of Libyans with actual influence on the ground. How do you measure that influence? We give them, make sure these people have the capacity to take a decision and make it actually transfer into reality, implementation. We're not seeing that. Ansmo had a very good opportunity last January in uh, Geneva, but they gathered a round table of people who don't have the capacity to walk freely in the constituents they're meant to represent. Uh, I don't see any step being taken so far as one that's going to uh, lead to any sort of peace. And I'll use this as a segue. We touched upon earlier, I can't remember who the Haftar Mitig deal and was framed as a Russian deal. I can tell you very uh, confidently that as soon as the war stopped and uh, Mitig came back from Moscow, Mitig started reaching out to um, powerful individuals in the East. Started from the tribal elders until he got to Haftar directly. The talks were between him and the deputy minister of finance or economy in the East. Uh, it took them less than 48 hours to come to an agreement. And then when things were getting serious, they realized, okay, we need some international guarantor. What was interesting is that both of them agreed to go to Russia. Uh, something that Ansmo isn't taking seriously enough is that we are left with one of two tracks at the moment. We have the UN initiative, which at the moment seems to be gathering a bunch of individuals who meet Ansmo's criteria, but not the criteria to solve the conflict. We have a saying in Libya saying for every problem, there's a solution of its own. Ansmo is just trying the same solutions over and over again. Uh, that's clearly have not worked in the past, such as the Skherat agreement. Uh, Ansmo needs to recognize that the way it's going at it now, it is making the Moscow track look very attractive for a lot of people. Moscow is working on its own campaign and it has gathered much more influential people than the ones we're going to see in a couple of weeks in Tunis. Wow, but why have things gotten to the way they have? It's due to, I mean, it's due to, uh, I'll finish it off in this final point. It's due to the way in which uh, the international community has been functioning. Rather than rewarding people who work towards gathering a consensus, they're congratulating and creating uh, leaders out of people who are working towards divisions. Today, we have a deputy uh, head of the HOR, uh, Fozin Wedi. He has been working tirelessly for four months to gather a quorum to sit down and sort everything through the HOR. He has been ignored by the international community up until two weeks ago when he was about to achieve a quorum and then they decided to intervene and do what they did to ensure that it didn't take place. Yet Aguila Saleh has not managed to get more than 20 people in a session when this man, his deputy has managed to get nearly 100. So the way in which the international community is operating now, it's congratulating people who enjoy spoiling, who enjoy the status quo, and creating opportunities for countries such as Turkey and Russia to further entrench themselves. So more buy-in is needed for these talks, uh, participation of real power brokers and people with actual representation. The concept of false prophets and false representations and propping up uh, figures can no longer do us well. It will just further divide the country. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, colleagues, we, we are really literally down to our last uh, four minutes. Um, I'll invite Jason and then Eunice. Um, and please, Jason, literally no more than a minute. And Eunice, the same thing, please. I was the one who was on time, uh, given the initial timings. But yes, so an optimistic point and a pessimistic point. To follow on what uh, Ambassador Weiner has said, Libya is one of the rare conflicts, and I would argue of the five major civil wars going on in the world, the only one, that a win-win solution can actually pay for itself. And a solution can be devised by Libyans, which benefits all Libyans, as well as all of the internationally interested parties. 
It's just a question of moving from a zero sum way of thinking about things to a positive sum way. And Libyans are close to that because they see the electricity out in East and in West. They see the oil blockades hurting East and West. They see the smuggled petrol affecting East and West. So there are win-win solutions. And now to the negative point, and this is that to enforce and mediate and get spoilers on the international and local levels out, you need an international system which functions. We talked about the way in which Unsmill's mandate is not sufficient for this. And um, Mad Dean made a very good point that some actors are aggressors and others are trying to defend themselves. This is of course very problematic because so long as the international system is broken in something like an enduring disorder where there is no way to get the major powers to collaborate and there are no institutional frameworks for that, how will they even sit down to achieve the solution that would be best for them in a win-win way? And it's like a question of behavioral economics. Jason, Jason, I'm going to ask you five seconds, please. Five seconds, really. Yes. In other words, people don't make the decision which is in their best interest. So it would truly be in everyone's best interest to share the oil wealth and to um, figure out win-win solutions. That's what I was about to say. Thank you, Jason. Eunice, please. Yes. Um, Less so basically, than yeah, I, I think that many mistakes were made from the beginning. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, I think uh, Libyans made the major mistake after the uh, collapse of the regime. They, they let the whole uh, initiative come out of their hand uh, to the extent that you have a multiplicity of foreign actors that makes it extremely difficult to resolve the situation. Other mistake, probably that is structural for the region, that we don't have um, regional mechanisms for conflict resolution. Uh, something like this should have been dealt uh, immediately by the Maghreb Union, which is unfortunately born still. It should have been done by the Arab League, which is not functional. Uh, now it, it has become to the level of international governance system, uh, which unfortunately has become very frail and fragile because of what we have seen all, all over the years. So I believe that for the Libyans to resolve this, they have to get their act together and try to uh, uh, resolve it um, mostly by themselves. I know that it's not easy. I know it has become very difficult because the Libya crisis is no longer a national issue. It's a regional and international one. And probably I would think that you cannot resolve it uh, only by looking at the Libya issue, but you have to look at other conflicts in the region. You can, I don't think you can now deal with Libya uh, per se alone, but you have to look at what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and all these uh, issues, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice. Uh, last, um, Karim, please. I give the final I'll be, I'll be, I'll be very, very, very short. It's not a matter of pessimism or optimism. It's a matter of analysis. I really don't believe that certain dynamics, both international and local, has been exhausted so far. I don't see on Smith having the strength or the power to, to act and, and be a real mediator and put an end. So I, I really believe that we are, we are still waiting for another clash or another military action. And that's what I'm, what I'm really afraid of. Sober and last points. And I think last, Imadian. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to say thank you very much to you. I won't give you the floor again because we did take up some time with a follow-up question. I'll give the, the last word to Emadine Badi, please. 30 seconds. I mean, the realistic outlook at this stage is, as Karim pointed out, is to be realistically, to a certain extent, pessimistic uh, because of the current dynamic. There is no point in being uh, optimistic when nothing is conducive to that. Uh, if that point of analysis is adopted, I think you can tackle things more constructively rather than having this choreography of optimism for some reason uh, without, without actual roots of the conflict being tackled. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, well, colleagues, uh, it's exactly 5.30. I think we've done very, very well with our time. But this has been so incredibly interesting a session. And I could only wish that we had a lot more time, not, not only a bit more time. But I want to thank all of you 
for your expertise and the depth of insights which you have shared, not only with me as your moderator, but with everybody else who has tuned in. I can only hope that we are able to do this again, uh, perhaps uh, dividing up our group into uh, smaller uh, segments, each tackling particular aspects of this very, very, very complex situation, which is Libya, in a way that allows us to delve much deeper into some of the complexities that are needed uh, to be interrogated at this point in time. But to all of you, thank you so very much for your time, for your expertise and for the wonderful insights that you've shared with all of us. To our partners, thank you very much. And on behalf of the Policy Center for the New South, thanks again and keep